Hello everyone, today's lesson is on statistical things. Now you may say, okay, well that's what we've been doing for the last few weeks, but we're gonna dig a little deeper and we're gonna compare the data displays and statistics and decide which would be the best display for each set of data. So comparing different statistical displays, I'm gonna pose the question to you, how many episodes of Stranger Things have most people watch? And I pose this to the characters on the show themselves. And Dustin collected some data and Dustin told me, I used a box plot to display my data. Mike called me on the walkie talkie and said, here's my dot plot. I collected information and this is what I found. And then Lucas told me he used a histogram to display his data. Let's analyze each one of these so we could see what the pros and cons of each particular statistical display would be. So first, looking at the box plot that Dustin created, there are some definite pros to using a box plot. First of all, I could see right away that the median, which is the center of this data, is nine. So most people that he asked watched nine episodes of Stranger Things, which would put them at the beginning of the second season. You can also see that there were some people that watched no episodes, some people that have watched the entire thing, and then you could talk about the interquartile range, which goes from three to 23. And that means that 50% of the people that he surveyed are somewhere in this range, meaning that they started watching it, um, and some people have gotten close to finishing it, and with the median being nine, it shows us that most people have at least watched the entire first season. Now, one thing that you cannot tell looking at Dustin's box plot is how many people he surveyed. You have no idea looking at this box plot if he surveyed five people, if he surveyed 100 people, if he surveyed a million people, you can't tell. So that's one of the downfalls of a box plot. Now, if I told you that he surveyed the exact 20 people as Mike and Lucas, then that would give you a little bit more information. And in fact, he did. So these, all three of these boys surveyed 20 people at Hawkins Middle School and the same 20 people. So the information on each is the same. Now looking at the dot plot that Mike created, you could sit there and you could have said, I know he surveyed 20 people because you could count each dot. And if you sit there and you count one, two, three, all the way through, you would see that yes, he surveyed 20 people. Besides that, there's not much else that I could use this dot plot for unless I sat and made calculations. I would have to cross one out from each side at a time to get to where I found my median to be nine. To find the mean, I'd still have to do calculations, but for the purpose of the dot plot, the best thing is that you can actually see how many people he surveyed. Now let's move on to Lucas. Lucas decided to use a histogram. I could also tell by looking at his histogram that he surveyed 20 people because seven people said they watched from zero to six, four people from seven to 13, three people from 14 to 20, and six people from 21 to 27. And if you add those numbers together, you would see that yes, he also surveyed 20 people. These are the same 20 people. So this, these three graphs show exactly the same information in three different ways. Now, one negative about the histogram, if you look at the intervals, it's not specific. So if you look at this last interval, 21 to 27, there's only 25 episodes of Stranger Things. So we don't know, looking at this last bar, if these individuals watch 25, 23, you don't know the specifics. You only know that they watched in that interval. Either way, those are three different ways that you could see this data. But one of the things that they did not do well is if you look back at this question, it says how many episodes of Stranger Things have most people watched? And right now, all they asked was 20 different people at their local middle school. Moving on, let's see some different ways to make this better data. Eleven called and said, hey, I went to a Stranger Things fan club meeting and I surveyed 25 individuals of all different ages. She's telling me that she thinks this is good data because all of the people she surveyed were, were not in the same grade level like Mike, Dustin, and Lucas found. So here's her data on a box plot. I can't, I can't tell how many people she surveyed looking at the box plot, but she told me she surveyed 25 individuals. So there, that's already, that's more data than the others collected. So that's a good thing. But then wait, I got a call here on the intercom from Susie. I don't know if you're a Stranger Things fan, but if you are, Susie is quite intelligent. She was able to help save everyone 
from the bad guys with her knowledge of Planck's constant. Anyway, so she told me I have the best data. She went to the local supermarket and surveyed every 10th person who walked out of the store. That makes her data ra random. So she surveyed 50 people and she told me that everyone she asked was different ages, some were men, some were women, meaning that there's no bias in her data collection. This word here is very important. We're gonna touch on it more in the next slide, but here's the data that she collected. Now, if you look at this data, you'll see there's a very wide spread. It goes all the way from zero to 25. Our intel quartile range is quite large, whereas 11's information was not as varied. Why? Because she only asked 25 individuals and she only asked individuals that were attending a Stranger Things fan club meeting. So obviously they like Stranger Things. So you wouldn't get these people that like Susie Pooh here has at the bottom where they didn't watch any episodes of Stranger Things yet. So good things about Susie's data. They were, it was random collection of data. There was 50 people, which is a good amount. They were different ages. Some were male, some were female. So her data collection so far that we're looking at is the best. So what exactly is bias? What data has bias? If you look there at that image below, Will is sending us a message. He's lighting up the B, the I, the A, and the S with his powers. So you understand that when you collect data from a sample population that is not varied, you're going to have bias. For example, if you only ask sixth grade students, or if you only ask boys, or if you only ask girls, or like in 11's case, if you only ask people attending a Stranger Things fan club meeting, you're not going to get a good variety of answers. So the more observations or data that you collect, the better representation of a whole population you will get in your data. So here is what bias data has. Like for example, if you only ask girls, if you only ask boys, if you only ask a specific group or a specific age, and you get the information from a small population, your data is not gonna be representative of the whole population. On the other hand, non-biased data would be if you asked random people. So if you see an example that explains that they picked someone's name out of a hat, if they draw, like called random people, or like when you saw Susie's data collection, she asked every 10th person that came out of the grocery store. That's gonna be good non-biased data. Asking a larger population is gonna help you as well. Asking all ages, all genders, and all types of people, that's gonna lead you to data that is a better representation of the entire population. Okay, moving on. Comparing data. Here is Steven Robin. They wanna know who is getting better tips working at Scoops Ahoy? Robin and Steve collected data over two weeks and recorded their results in box plots. So here we go. This is Robin's box plot that shows her tips. So those are um, those numerical values represent dollars. And Steve's tips over the last two weeks as well with those numbers representing dollars. All right, so looking at those two box plots, let's just compare them and analyze them and see who whose tips would I rather get? Well, first, if I look, I see that Steve's box plot is more varied. He has a wider range, which not is not necessarily a good thing if we're talking about tips. So someone here at the very bottom only tipped him two dollars and something, and then all the way here, wow, he got a tip of twenty-one dollars at an ice cream shop. That's pretty amazing. Now Robin's data is not as varied. And we're talking about tips. So hers, her tips are what we call more consistent. So she, her lowest tip, which this is kind of um, not really reasonable. People don't tip this much at an ice cream shop. But her smallest tip, according to her data, was $9. And her largest tip was 19 Now, although Steve has this $21 tip here, or maybe it's a couple of 21 I would rather get Robin's tips. Because if you look, the median, meaning like her average tips was $15, whereas Steve's median is somewhere in between $12 and $13. So that means the majority of his tips were probably smaller. His interquartile range is from like $7.50 to just about $17, whereas 50% of Robin's tips, so her IQR, so her interquartile range is from 13 to 16. That's super high for an ice cream shop. But if you would imagine having 50% of your tips from $13 to $16, whereas Steve's ranged from like $7 and something 
to just about 17. I think if you, even though this 17 is higher than the 16, you would prefer that that would be where your tips are at. But the purpose of this slide is to show you that the larger the spread, the more varied the data. Whereas Robin's box plot is smaller and more concise, that means that the data in Robin's tips is more consistent. All right, last slide here. Better representation of data. You see there, Eleven loves waffles. She wanted to know how many waffles does the typical teenager eat on a weekly basis? So she asked this question to her friends and Mike, Will, Dustin, and Lucas all collected data by asking students in their classes at Hawkins Middle School. Now, because she wanted to know just about teenagers, it's okay that they asked students in their classes at Hawkins Middle School, as long as they were asking girls, boys, and different, like say sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, then all of these are gonna be a good representation of teenagers. Now, whose data is a better representation? So all four boys decided to put their data on a dot plot. Mike, Will, Dustin, and Lucas's dot plots are shown. What would make one better than the other? Well, if you look closely, the only difference is the number of people surveyed. Mike only surveyed six people. If you count those dots, he only surveyed six individuals. Lucas and Will a little bit more, but the key here to Dustin's data being the best is he surveyed much more people than the others, making his data the best representation. If you would look, it seems as though most teenage kids eat around two waffles a week. So that would give 11 the best data representation. All right, I hope you enjoyed this strange lesson. Have a great day.